tonight we've been doing a series called The Wisdom Within Us, The Reigning in Life in Christ. Wisdom within us. Now, folks, people, I believe, Christians, well-meaning, well-loved Christians. I'm not going to put any of God's children down because that's an awful mouth. But when a person gets born again, we know that God comes in our heart. Now, is he wisdom? Okay, here's the key that I want to talk to you. Always as a Christian, depend upon God dwelling in you. Don't talk to God as he's out there in space somewhere. Bring him on home. <laughs> I think there's a song like that. But anyway, the reason being is because you asked him to come into your heart and forgive your sins. So he's in your heart. So talk to God, not like he's far away. Talk to God as, as if he's close, as close could be. And remember, he's in seed form. Now, I know that's going to sound strange maybe if you're new. But he's in seed form. Think about a seed. If I plant a cotton seed, what's in a cotton seed? Cotton. But it's a perfect cotton seed because there's a full cotton and more cotton, 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 going out through the generations. Can you say amen? So Jesus came into our heart like a seed for us to understand how he develops in us. We bring the seed, put it in the ground, put it in our heart, and then we take the seed and we subject the seed to sunshine, God. And it's more often to, to good watering the word. We give it. The seed will quickly develop in our heart and take over our life. Now, did not we ask Jesus to be Lord of our life? That means he should be in driving, driving the seat be in their work and the, leading the way. Say amen. But we're learning to surrender daily and get out of the way and sit in the back seat. I love this a little song. I was barreling out full speed ahead. I was running every stop sign that I could see, thinking I was giving the Lord a shortcut. But I found out he didn't need any help from me. So now I'm riding in the back seat. And I'm leaving all the driving to the chief. And the key is, no, it's not that you don't help with the decisions. And no, it's not that your will is not involved. The key is, as a child of God, and we have such a vast, wonderful Heavenly Father, who would never harm us or hurt us, he, we need to be less prideful and relinquish our automobile, our life to him. And remember, we did that once, maybe. But you have to do it, like, on a daily basis because we still have areas of our life that we haven't let go of. Now, come on, be honest. I'm working on some things, too. So that's why Christians aren't supposed to pick on one another because we're all working on something. And if I come over and, and let's say I say something to you and, if I, and, I, and it's, it's directly something you need to work on, I'm not really trying to pick on what you know you should be working on. I'm trying to help you to, to do something about it. You know, when God tries to get a hold of some people, I think, you know, we don't mean to, but I think we get preoccupied and he's not getting through. So he might have somebody say that same thing to say, hey, you need to be really taking care of this. Oh, oh, I, you know, I believe God's been telling me about that. You see, it works that way because he loves all of his children. He will do his best to keep you on the path with him. Can you say amen? Now, let me ask you, let's see how much you know as a Christian. What is the Holy Spirit's job? Now he's in the earth. He's brought the kingdom of heaven. What is the Holy Spirit's job so that you might understand? To guide us through this life. Now, if we're being guided, that doesn't mean wander off the trail. Now, I don't know about you. I remember going to Montana. Scott, you'll love this. The Lewis and Clark Caverns. And yet they take you a tour. But you have to walk a mile up just to get to them. Now, can, you know, that was when I was younger. They used to have a tram you got on. It took you up. The, the point I'm making is... You have to follow the guide through all these little holes down through these vast chambers and stuff. And if you're claustrophobic, the first thing you want to do is run the other way. So that's what the enemy tries to do. There's a path, 
and a person that we need to follow. It isn't hard. But you cannot follow Jesus with a lot of pride. Blink your eyes at me. You see, pride is the very thing Satan fell with. And God hates pride more than anything. Because pride moved Adam and Eve away from God and they fell. Satan said to him, oh, God's just hiding the truth from you. And, and God knows that if you eat this, you're going to be just like him. Well, the devil hasn't changed his tactics any. He just, he just, can I tell you something? Every one of us lives in Christ. Are we in Christ? Come on, wave your hands. Lift it up. Let the devil see that you're in Christ. I mean, te- this is a testimony when I ask you to do that. When I tell you, don't lift your hands, I'll, please don't do it. You guys are in a tank. Have you ever seen an army, a military tank? Okay. That's Jesus. You're in a tank. And outside of the tank is a little fellow with a squirt gun. That's the devil. The only thing about it is he's got a big blowhard horn that only works when you are prideful to draw you to get out of that tank so you can get shot. Now, are you that stupid? No, I'm not that stupid. Take a look, Christian. How many are outside of the tank And they're getting beat up all the time. And they go, I don't know why God is doing this to me. Get in the tank! Get into Jesus! Come on! Don't let this junk you see out here. This is not what we're seeing. Even the Christian stuff is good. But my goodness, strain out all this stuff and don't get out of the tank! The tank is your prayer closet. The tank is walking in Jesus. The tank is walking the word of God. The tank is moving by the spirit of God. The tank is having the most powerful weapon in the world. I smack the devil every day and I don't do it with my hands. I do it with my words and I release Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name, the enemy is trying to work on my family. I invite you in to smack him out of there in Jesus' name. And don't be starting, I bind and I rebuke because you're in the flesh now and the devil will punch you back. Remember, you're out of the tank. Satan will do his best to get you out of your tank. Stay in the tank. Use the electronic spiritual equipment in Jesus to discern what you do all day. And don't get out of the tank. Isn't that a good revelation? I hope you get that. Get it. I, I, I preach in pictures. I'm kind of a funny guy that way, but I want you to see the picture. You are so well protected. Christ is in us. We are in Christ. We are in Christ in God. That means in order for the devil to get to us, he has to go through God, and God's not going to let that happen. But because you and have, I have a choice, He lures and teases us, gets us to do things, and we get out of the tank like some dummy and robot, and we get smacked. And then we turn around. I'm talking generally. And then the church turns around and says, God, why did you let this happen? And then some wise idiot says, excuse my expressions, God must be teaching you something. Really, we used to believe, all of us used to believe that. Yes, well, God is, your father is not that estranged. He's adopted you, but he's totally accepted you. Why? Because you're clothed in Christ. This is a funny joke. For Christ's sake. Get it? I meant it in a good way. I love teasing you guys a little, but still, think about it. We've, We've now lived a while. We've been on the planet for a while. Let's not make the same mistakes we made yesterday. Are you ready to get in the lesson? Please. Amen. All right. Praise God. So reigning in life in Christ, the wisdom we have within us. Amen. Let's turn and read our scripture. Proverbs chapter 2, 1 through 7. I'm going to read it rather quickly. You'll see things here that will sort of jump out at you. That's God downloading teaching to you. He does that to you. You're his child. 
I'll speak words, but he'll download what you need to hear from what I say or what we read. That's how preaching and teaching is all about, to describe and paint pictures so that you may receive and, and be drawn close to God. So Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1, my son, if you receive my words, notice the word receive, and treasure my commands, what are the two commandments in the New Testament? Love the Lord thy God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as I have loved you. Old Testament is you love yourself. There's a lot of people who don't love themselves, so that's Old Testament. And, you know, we believe in the Old Testament. We don't practice the law. We practice grace. And that goes on further. So that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. Yes, if you cry out for discernment, give me a, the ability to choose right from wrong. What's right? What's wrong? And four, if you seek her as silver and search for her as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord. God will reveal things to you. What's the fear of the Lord? Respect God because there's no other choice. If you go anywhere else, <laughs> you won't want that. God's trying to rescue us. If you're drowning, you stay by yourself, you will drown. Hypothermia, sharks will get you. Get rescued. And quick. If you seek her, silver. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom. Say amen. amen. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. That's you, by the way. You have Jesus. And he is a shield. In other words, he's completely protecting you to those who walk uprightly. So what does the devil try to do? Get you out of the tank. Get you into yourself and argue. And listen, I might say something you don't agree. Worst thing you could do, let's argue about it. No, no. If you have a prove a point, I'll let you prove it. And then you'll find out you're wrong. Arguing is a tool enemy uses to sap our strength. Don't argue. Simply say, okay, you might be right. And, and, and Linda, you're really good at that. And that's really good because it's held the family together a lot. Everybody argues. Everybody, the enemy tries to get us all into that triding, jiding. Don't be divided up. Okay? Don't be divided up on any issue and be solid with God. There's only one thing you can hate, and that's the enemy and all that he does. And we can be divided away from him. But don't be divided about amongst ourselves. Say amen. Okay. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth comes understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He shields those that walk uprightly. And in Proverbs 20 verse 5, listen. It says, counsel or wisdom in the heart of a man is like deep water. But a man of understanding will draw it out. Have you ever been to a well and had to actually draw up the bucket? That's exactly what we do. Inside of you is Jesus. Inside of you is a whole package. All things that pertain to life and godliness. But in order for us to tap God in us, we first have to be humble. And then ask God to help us. And then he will allow us to dip down into the things of God and you'll bring up into the eyes of our understanding the things that we need personally in our walk with God to help touch people's lives and to win our family to the Lord. I believe that we have a very dysfunctional, and please don't get mad at me, I'm part of that too. A body of Christ is very dysfunctional. Because the way when we look at everything, certain areas are really, really blessed, and other areas are suffering so much. Listen, it's a complete body of Christ. If you got a pain in your back, the whole body suffers. Hey, and it could be me, a pain in your butt. Oh, just move on. <laughs> Good, Michael, you got that. Now, that is not a cuss word, by the way. Okay, so I can't believe he said that. Think about it. I'm real. I'm going to tell you the truth. Why? Because I want to see you make it and as many people you can take with you. How many people have you actually won to the Lord? You need to be winning people to the Lord. That's the first command. Besides loving God, go into all the world. 
So think about that. No wonder the enemy makes us stale. Because all it is is about us getting our needs met. No, 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 no. Get souls saved and your needs will be more than met. All right, moving right along. So dip down into the council and bring God up. Say amen. All right, we're going to cover four areas. Number one, faith and trust. What the difference is, are they are of the same, but they activate differently. Two, listen daily to God and follow him. Listening is a real, real key. We have two ears and one mouth, and how much do you talk? Think about it. I'm not trying to pick. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I found out I'm a real talker. I have the gift to gab. <laughs> but I need to curb what I talk about. Can you say amen? When you come into church, don't talk about how you hate your aunt. And don't talk about how you don't like what's coming up in election year. Come in here and lift one another up and pray for one another. So the atmosphere is so electric with God's love that people actually can come in here and get saved, put, be pulled off of the street. Say amen. And there, thirdly, where is the wisdom from above? Bible talks in James about having the wisdom that comes from above and what it looks like and what it does. And then fourthly, two kinds of wisdom. So again, faith and trust. We're going to talk about listening daily and following. Three, where wisdom of God is from above. Where's the wisdom from above? And then fourthly, two kinds of wisdom. Are you ready? All right, point one, faith and trust. Go with me to Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. We're going to look at something. We've talked a little bit about a seed. We're going to talk about a seed again. In verse 17, verse 20, it says, So Jesus said to them, Because of your flesh, unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed. Now, we know the story. What had happened is Jesus was going to Jerusalem, possibly one of his last times, and he was going to teach a lesson. And I'm going to just tell you, so you, it's not a mystery. The fig tree usually, not always, represents Israel. And what Israel was doing is they were rejecting God by rejecting the Messiah, Jesus. And so he taught us disciples a lesson, but also taught them about faith. Everyone say, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I need to explain a little bit, so give me the grace to explain this. So they're passing by. They cur Jesus cursed the pig tree because pigs, usually when they have start to flower and bud, they've got some fruit on them. Jesus know the time of the pigs, there should be figs, but there wasn't any figs. In other words, they had the leaves, but no fruit. Folks, let our life have fruit and leaves, not just leaves. Don't be all talk and no walk. And that's what he was saying to Israel. But then he turns to his disciples and he says, look, as they came back, they saw the tree was withered. They pointed it out to him. He says, look, if any of you have faith as a mustard seed, just a teeny little seed, you could be able to say to this mountain, be thou removed, be planted in this seed. Now, two things I want to, the mountain doesn't mean only a physical mountain. It also means you might have a mountain in your life that seems to be getting in the way of your growth. You can say to that mountain, God wants me over there and you're in my way. You can speak to that mountain with Jesus in you. Now, go back to the seed. Who's the seed in our heart? No, nope. I'm, I'm glad you guys are real. Jesus. You wimp. Jesus. And he's strong and mighty in you. But you've got to keep him growing and developing. Now, does Jesus have faith? Does Jesus have the ultimate faith? Is Jesus' faith greater than our faith? That's what he's talking about. If you have faith, me in your heart, like a mustard seed. Let it develop and grow. Then you're not going to have to use your faith. You just release my faith through your words. How did you get Jesus in your heart? Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come in my heart. I believe you died, rose again, and I confess Jesus as Lord. Just something simple. You believed in your heart, confess with your mouth. Boom! Same thing works with miracles. Because God does a miracle working. 
You release God. You are the host. He is what you release. I'm not teaching religion here. I'm teaching facts and how to get results. So if you have faith, just as a seed, now we know the seed is Jesus. Even that seed, because it's Jesus, can move a mountain, your mountain. Did you get it? All right, let's move on to the next point. Okay? Be removed and cast in the sea and do not doubt in his heart. Now, I told you about heart. Oh, I hope you guys get all of this stuff. Your heart has two things in it. We're not talking about boom, 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 boom. We're talking about the heart core of your life is your spirit and your soul. Everyone say spirit and soul. Say spirit and soul. That's your heart. So your spirit man is the inner man of the heart. And your soul is the outer man of the heart. So your soul is affected still by fallen nature and all. But your spirit man has who in it? That's right. You have Jesus in your spirit. And it's affecting your other part of your heart, your soul, and will influence your body if you don't get distracted and all fragmented. See, I won't. Now, listen to this. Jesus is developing in you, so that's why the enemy keeps you in problems all the time. Tries to keep you, and, and you say, well, not really me. Well, good, that's good, it's working. Let God work in you, remember? His faith doesn't fail. His patience doesn't give up. Remember it says, let patience have her perfect work? The New Testament says, let patience, Jesus, have his perfect work. Colossians 2 says it is God who works in us. Ephesians 3.20 says who begun a good work. And, and, and at Philippians 1.6, these are all talking about God has not stopped working in you. But what the enemy's done is kept us so distracted, we don't have time to be with God. And that's how we germinate and turn more into Jesus. Prayer and being with God. That's the only way it happens. You don't grow when you're doing things physically. You're too distracted. But we enjoy and we learn. But you don't grow spiritually only but in the presence and God growing you up spiritually. Say amen. And now you want to know, let me just tell you funny, why so many Christians are crabby and rude. They haven't grown up spiritually. Now don't get mad at me. I was that way. I thought I had it together, you know. Grow up. Focus on growing up and becoming Christ-like. On the way, you'll have plenty of wonderful things to do. And remember, God grows you up. You don't grow yourself up. Say amen. Let me say it again. It's worth saying again. God grows us up. We don't grow ourselves up. God is the one that brings the good out of what was not so good. We don't do that ourselves. I tried my best to be good. <laughs> Hello? Only God in me is good, so I let God take over. All right, we got past that. Say amen. Let's go to our second scripture. Look at this one. Mark 11, verse 22 through 24. After the tree had withered, Jesus said, so Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. The Hebrew excuse me, the Greek says, have the God kind of faith. Now, you are, I already told you what that is. Who do you have in you? Okay, the word have means utilize the God kind of faith. It's a tool. Jesus is a tool in you. I'm not going to tell what God wants to do. No, he asks you to believe, to release him. Whose faith do we have? And ours. Hello? And if we don't release, yeah, our faith has to go to connect with Jesus. You just don't operate in your faith alone because it's too weak. That's why we fail. That's why we feel like, oh, I just feel like I'm going to. Yes, you do and I do too when things are not in focus. Again, my job is to help 
all of us, including myself, to get us focused and in sync with God's rhythm so that we can move through this life, finish our race with joy. Hello? For the race set before him, the joy that was set before him. The race set before you, who are we looking to? The author and the finisher, the joy set before us of our faith. All right, Mark says, so Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God or have my kind of faith in you. For surely I say to you, whosoever says or speaks to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart. This is the upper outer man. Your mind is a doubter. So make sure you don't run your Christianity off your mind. Hey, what's on your mind? Stop right there. <laughs> Come on. I hope it's Jesus. Uh, come on, laugh with me. Okay. And it says, and do not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things which he says, the word says there has an S on it, that things which he is continually saying, continually saying. What are we continually saying? Are we saying up one time because we feel good and down the next time because we feel bad? You're double-minded. <laughs> and Satan doesn't have to do anything. You're beating your own self up. Nope. We get rid of the bitter fountain. We shut down all that stuff. Telling God, oh God, you know, I hurt and I do that. And God says, will you please? I know that. Please speak my word and believe it so I can help you. Your crying and whining is not going to make God move. It's going to be your faith. I know that's harsh, but... But I didn't say it. God did. Emotion is very untrustable. Let your emotions follow your faith. Don't let your emotions dictate how you believe. Okay? Say amen. All right. So when he goes on, he says, Therefore I say to you, whatsoever things you ask, when you pray, believe. Remember Hebrews 11.6, he must believe in God, and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Must believe, it says, that you, that you receive them. Now listen, when I send for my license on a new car, I don't really get my license, but I get my license. They send me a temporary license, a little cardboard thing. But I know my license is coming. Say amen. Jesus got all kinds of good stuff in you. You've got the down payment cardboard license. And it's going to the real manifestations of your healing and all these things that God has promised us is coming. So when you walk around, hold up your license. Let me clarify. The devil needs to see you belong to somebody or he'll go after you. So every time you get up in the morning, learn to hold up your license. His name is Jesus. And you are marked and you're set to be a to be a child of God, and you become a child of God, and you will be a child of God. Let me explain. You get saved by faith. Jesus comes into your heart, really. But then it's a journey, renewing your mind and going through the walk with Jesus. So you're being a process of salvation. But one day that trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ will rise, and boop, we'll be changed. So you're saved, being saved, and we'll be totally saved. 30, 60, and uh, 100 fold. There's a lot of that in the Bible, isn't there? All right, a couple of points I'm going to give you. Church, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, Jesus said that we are born again when we accept him, so we have his faith. Say amen. Two, faith is an aggressive while trust is passive. For example, we believe for things, but we trust God to receive them. 
We believe for things and we kick back and trust to receive them. To believe you receive them. Trust is what Jesus said. Hey, boys, I'm paraphrase. Please bear with me. I want you to get in the boat, go to the other side. I'll see you there. Now, it's a little bit more detailed, and I'm not trying to belittle the word. I'm just trying to get through the story real quick. So they all get in the boat. You know it. And they get down there, and the devil has a storm. By the way, Satan has a lot of these storms. It's not God. And you have control over weather. I'll talk about, let's do it at lunch. But all of a sudden, Satan sends a storm, and it's a horrific storm. Because remember, these fellows were fishermen. Do you think they've seen a storm or two there on Galilee? But this wasn't any storm you can imagine. This was a satanic storm and weather. So they were frightened. But what did Jesus tell them? See you on the other side. I'm going to tell you that. That's the Old Testament. Because Jesus is not in their boat the first time. He's out on the boat. And all of a sudden they cry out and they see someone walking on the water. Who is that? Jesus, isn't it? And of course, Peter opens his mouth and says, it's a ghost. And Jesus says, Peter, it's me. Sheep may hear my voice. Come out. Get out of the boat, Peter, and come towards me. And so he did. I want to let you know, when you get caught up in God, supernatural things happen. And he was supported above the water as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus. Good lesson to learn. God will always support you and help you as best as he can if you allow him, keeping your eyes on Jesus. And then, of course, Peter started looking around and he sang and Jesus picked him up. That's Old Testament-ish. Let's go to the New Testament. And now we see Jesus getting in the boat and we're all headed to the other side. That's New Testament. Who's in your boat? Jesus is in your boat. And though you may encounter storms and frustrations of life, glory to God, you're going to the other side. Can anyone say amen? Can you feel that anointing? Jesus is in your boat. Please let him be the captain. The captain of our salvation. Anyway, the storm came again. Satan always tries this. Remember, the devil doesn't have any new tricks. He just puts a new label. It's no longer Nally's. It's now Lay's. Whatever. <laughs> Same devil. Now, I'm not against potato chips. I had a bunch last night. It was good. Okay? The idea behind it is, is he always rebrands stuff so we might not recognize. Go back in history and study some history. The problem with the United States is the this crowd that's supposedly in charge don't know our history and why we have the freedom we do. They need to go back and study. But they went to school. Have you been to school lately? Why is it you'll spend your almost entire life learning very little anything? You get most of it on the internet and the books they give you. I know, I'm a college person, okay? You know what I studied? Anthropology. Study of man. I found out there's some weird things out there that people aren't telling us. But let's go on. Let's go to point two. Everyone say, I got it. We need to listen daily and learn to follow. A good example of that, read the story of Elijah and Elisha. How Elisha followed Elijah. How he did it, what he said, how he followed. That's how Jesus wants us to follow him. He didn't say lead him. He didn't say call on him once in a while. Sherry will tell you, you can't date Jesus. Only meet with him when you're in trouble. You marry Jesus. You know, I don't tell my wife. I have a wonderful wife. And she's so blessed. Amen. Anyway, so, but I don't tell my wife. I'm, I'm not, you know, if I, if I do this, it's not good. I suddenly call her up by phone and say, I, I decided to take a week off from you, dear. I'm fishing. How long do you think my marriage would work? Why do we do that with God? We just get into what we're doing. We think we're doing it for God. Did God ask you to do it? And we get into it, and you've got to be careful in that. Listen to be careful. This is for somebody. 
Sometimes we get to feeling so good, we, get, we end up making the same mistakes again, not thinking about what we're doing. Don't get so giddy that you're drunk with stupidity. And drunk doesn't mean drinking. It means being intoxicated. Don't be intoxicated with your glory and your interest and your excitement to leave God out and then step into the doo-doo of the devil he sets up. Because the greatest attacks that he does on Christians is after they have won a victory. It's a counterattack. We've taught our congregation to keep the armor on at all times. Can you say amen? How many here need to know more about the armor of God? Come on, show me your hands. Good. The armor of God is Jesus. He's light. So don't separate. The only reason you see pieces of the armor mentioned in Ephesians is Paul wanted the people there to relate how Jesus was around each part of the body. Your breastplate, your belt of truth, feet shod with the preparation. But our armor is Jesus. Now, let me share this. I'm going to share it again till the church of Jesus Christ worldwide gets this. You don't ever have your armor fall off. It never falls off. Jesus never leaves you, forsakes you. So let's wise up. What he does is you dim them. You dim the light by you taking over control of your life. And we do that without thinking. So that's why I say to you, present yourself daily so he gets those right disciplines moving and we get into the right rhythms so that we always stay bright and shiny. Now, I want to tell you something. What happens to darkness when you flip on a light? It goes away. It runs away. What's the speed of darkness? There is no speed until you flip the light on. Keep the light bright. You are the light of the world. How do I do that? Meet with God every morning. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness, Lord. Make sure I'm all tuned in and tuned up. Order my steps today. You know, my routines that I have to go through. And now I ask you in every part of that routine and smooth them out for me. Bing, 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 bing. Hello? Come on, you're the best. You're Christians. People have been hiding this and trading it by religion. You never know what God's going to do. I do. I know he's going to be good. I might know not specific specifics, but I know God every day is good. Now, here's the one that I like. If I'm ever invited again, and I will be, in, to go speak. I love to go speak, other churches and everything. Then I can hit them and run. But you, I love you, and I, I'm with you almost all the time. You can come over and visit, call first, though. And I have a gazebo over there and a fire pit, and you, we can talk about Jesus all day. This place was designed for Christians to hang out here. Yet, do you see a ton of Christians hanging out here? Why? Don't try to answer it. Go get them. Go get them. Oh, I don't want to pull somebody from... A lot of Christians are staying home because they don't know something like this exists. And there are other wonderful churches too. And I want you to experience as much as you want we got. Let's go to point two. All right, John chapter 10, one through four. Now, I love this. This is what we call a revealing of a mystery because Jesus is talking about two things simultaneously. He says in verse 1, Most assuredly, I say to you, that he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, is the thief and the robber. Now, who's the thief and the robber? Satan is. So he wasn't born in the earth. He stole the earth from who? Adam. Quickly, this is important, never forget this. I own a house, and I decide to lease it to Linda, Sherry's mom. So that does not give me the right to go in to the house I own anytime I want because Linda's in charge of it. And then she decides she, she didn't want to deal with it, so she subleases it to Sherry O. 
or somebody let's leases it to an enemy. Okay, not Cheerio. I got. I don't want to do that. <coughs> Excuse me. So does that mean I can go into that house anytime I want? No. Does that mean that Linda can go into that house anytime? She, no. That's what Adam did with the earth. He gave it to the devil. That's why it's in such bad condition. God has never taken control over man's control, and man gave it to the devil. So Jesus came to get it back and to get us back. This is the rescue plan. Now, God wants everybody saved. Would you agree? But is everybody going to get saved? No, you have to tell them how to. You have to go and reach to them. Call them up. Write them a letter. If they do not, because nobody shared with them. Don't preach religion. Don't tell them they're a sinner. Tell them there's a door open for them to get out of this terrible life and to walk with God. That's all you need to tell them. And if their heart's right, they'll run to you. Make sure you know what to tell them. And you know what? The church has gotten away from that. You want to know why Billy Graham was so blessed? He never got away with what God first told him to do. And now he's home. Who's going to take a Billy Graham's place? Who's going to take others doing the same? You are. Say amen. Moi? Yes, you. Okay? Anyone that enters a sheepfold by any other means but coming through the door is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. First of all, God had to be born into the earth in order for him to die for mankind. He had to become a man. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. He came, died, rose again, and became our ticket out of here. Now, from that point, let's read on. Look at this. And it goes on. But he who enters by the door, comes in a natural birth, is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the Holy Spirit, the doorkeeper, opens. And the sheep hear his what? You see, you have who in you now? Okay, here's the problem. Every born-again believer should be able to hear God's voice. Now, I know they don't. And I'm going to tell you why. Because we haven't settled in and become quiet enough to get used to the voice we're hearing. Many of us are hearing a lot of information coming from all over. Voices of God don't come to your head. I said the voices of God don't come to your head. They come right down to the core of your gut. And when God speaks to you, it's right out of your belly core, right here. Not here. And if you listen to voices in your head, you won't have your mind very much longer. Voices coming into you, don't sit there and repeat that. Now, we, do, we covered that in our Bible study. But nevertheless, please go back. We have a lot of good teaching in our archives I've done through the years. and Get a hold of something if it's going to bless you or teach you, okay? All right. To him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them what? That's right. God is leading you out from the inside out. What? He led you out of Egypt, out of sin, by accepting his son into his marvelous son's light. Say amen. That happened instantly when you prayed the prayer of salvation. But it takes a while to get sin out of us because we have bad thinking. Our flesh wants to do wrong things. So we have to present ourselves to God, a living sacrifice, and he washes that away as we're in the word in prayer. Say amen. And remember, the devil's going to keep you from praying and worshiping as much as he can because that's how you develop. And if you develop more like Jesus, he can't deal with you. You become too smart and too wise for the devil to deal with you. Because Jesus is pretty smart, pretty wise, don't you think? And we're to become like him, and he'll make us that way. Oh, I can't wait. My wife's saying, hurry up, Lord, with my husband. Gosh, you guys didn't get that. Let's move on. The rest of uh, 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 John 10 says, and the sheep go 
and follow him. He goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his what? You can't know somebody's voice if you haven't spent any time with them. My wife knows my voice. I know her voice. And sometimes I hear something that sounds so close, I said, dear, did you call for me? No. <laughs> I'm making this up. But you get used to people and their voices and all that. Come on, that's natural the way we're designed. Once you walk with the Lord and he becomes your shepherd, he guides you and you follow him. And believe me, it's not as religious sounding as it sounds. It's a lot of fun. I've never had so much fun following Jesus. I can tell you when I first got saved, I went and got saved a month and a half. I'm just going to tell you. Can I tell you a little bit? I, got saved, I was about saved a month and a half in a home fellowship on Angeline Road, right there in Bonnie Lake. And a guy just got filled with the Holy Ghost just before. We were, they were praying for everybody. And he got his spiritual language and went outside and shot his hands in the air, hit his knees and started praising the Lord. And I was looking at that and I was going, wow, that is absolutely cool. Now remember, I'm an ex-rock and roll drummer. I think you can grow marijuana and give it to the church. Now this is before I really got cleaned up. And I'm just, just, I'm just kind of all goofy, but yet God just kept pulling me closer to him. And, you know, I said, oh, Lord, this is really neat. And as soon as I said that, I mean, God be the glory. I'm sitting on a little footstool, and I'm looking at 30 people and my pastor across from me. And in walking through the glass doors, not opening them, came the Lord Jesus Christ. And he walked right on in. And he stood before me. And he was in this beautiful white and blue royal robe. His eyes were so deep and piercing that I could look right through him. Now, the funny thing about it was, is he was silhouetted as well as physical. Because everybody in the room saw him too. Now, I'm telling you this because sometimes God needs to do something like this. Don't you be closed off God doing anything supernatural with you because it's always good and it's always perfect. And I don't know what to do. I'm only a month and a half in the Lord. And I just go, wow. And I felt like wax going to be poured out through my body. And I felt like I was slipping off the stool and yet I'm standing up who I believe is Jesus. And he did not open his mouth or say anything, but he said to me, let's see if I can get it right. He says, in the last parts of your life, I will open doors that no man can close and I will close doors no man can open. And though you will be rejected when you're younger, you'll be accepted when you're older. And because I have taught you many things that I want you to share, I have called you in the ministry. Now, I made it sound great to me. That was all French. Remember, I was only a month and a half old. Here stood the Lord. Now, the funny thing, don't get, please don't get weird about this. I, I just think it should happen to everybody. Okay? And, and, and the weird thing about it was, is I couldn't believe whether I was in my body or out of my body, whether I was dreaming this, thinking this, until everybody said, did you see that, Carrie? See that? Jesus was here, and they all started, you know, singing and dancing, these old Pentecostal people. And I said, what do you think he wanted? And I just nodded, and my pastor said to me, Brother Alan Sires, he said, you are called to the ministry, son, and it, from this point on, your life is going to completely change. He says, I don't know all that he has for you, but everybody in this room is called to the ministry, and you're just another one. It says, now you pay close attention. It's, your life's going to be adventure from here on out. Now, that's my prayer and Linda's prayer for you. I don't care if I just met you today. I want you to have that kind of walk with God. Oh, I, 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 I don't know. See, there you go thinking again. <laughs> that could get you into trouble. Are you with me? Hope you didn't mind sharing that. So I know that I am called to these last days. That's why I didn't just go to Miami and live on the beach. I could do it. Linda and I could just. No, we are called here for you for some wonderful reason. And I'm going to stick to it. 
Sticking with it, sticking to it is the key to breaking through and coming into the other end. We're going to the other side. A couple of things. Church, we as believers must learn to hear the voice of God, the shepherd. We have to spend time with him. His voice is within us, deep in our inner man. Two, we also find his voice in the word through grace. Discovering him through the grace and wisdom that he gives us. I often tell people, and I'm going to clarify, to read the New Testament first, because the Old Testament might get confused and lost. Let me clarify. I believe in the Old Testament. It's an absolute perfect covenant. But the flaw is man. There was nothing to redeem man in the law, only to tell man you need a savior. So the law to a Gentile, you and I, and we're not Jewish, is simply you can't save yourself, you need Jesus. That's what the law says. Now, if we go back under the law and try to do this just right and go try to do this just right, now it sounds like I'm mocking, but I'm not. You're going to find yourself worn out because the law was made only to instruct us and point us to Christ. Read Galatians. That's why people, I'm going to mention it, there are people out today that love Jesus, but they're being Judaized. Galatians chapter says that don't let the Judaizers put you back under the bondage of trying to practice the law. So let me clarify. I love the Old Testament. I loved everything in it. But not until I first learned about Jesus, how he acts, how he operates. So I don't get confused because the law teaches only white and black. Do it or else. That's the law. We can't do that. I don't know about you, but have you told a little fib lately? You broke the law. Now you're going to get stoned. You see? So don't be letting this romantic people who make the Old Testament so romanticized that we lose our way with Jesus. That's the message. Be careful of the Judaizers that want you to wave flags and jump around like you're still in the Old Testament waiting for the Messiah to come. Jesus already came. He lives in your heart. Don't deface him nor slap him by practicing the law. Say amen. That's what my pastor told me. And that is a big amen. Because there are people just down the street trying to match Jesus and the law. And Jesus and the law. And Galatians says they have fallen from the favor of God. That's not good. Say amen. Now you notice in all my preaching, I've never come against any individual, just practices that are not right. Remember that. Make note. Okay. Proverbs chapter, I love this. This is about wisdom, our second point. Proverbs chapter 8, verses 34 and 35 says, Blessed is a man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the posts of my doors. For whosoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. Now, that's talking about eagerness, willingness to listen. What is God telling? Because the world is not telling us a bunch of good stuff. There's some good out there, but it's not all good. Go to a school PTA meeting if they'll let you in. Find out what they're teaching the kids. It depends on the teacher. Hello? Don't let anti-Jesus people become in control because you belong to God. And the reason why we see so much hecticness is these people have rejected God now, there's a chance for every one of us. But to reject God means chaos. And what is the devil doing? He's trying to get people to go the other way, Adam and Eve. Adam, where are you, Adam? Come to me. Look at Proverbs chapter 1, verse 33. I love this. Say, this is mine. Remember the practicing of the word? But whosoever listens to me will dwell safely. Why? Because the devil 
cannot hide from God. And if you're dwelling with God, do you think God's going to let the devil come in? No. How does he get in? We invite him. You dwell in a tank. Are you going to let the enemy crawl into that little porthole into your tank? Then watch what you say. Never speak against another child of God, even if you think they're a, a boom and do boom, you know, whatever that is. And you might not like them. Don't speak against what belongs to God, or you will be put out of the tank, and the enemy will squirt you. Remember he has a squirt gun? Why do you say that, Pastor? Because all of his armament had been stripped. Jesus, the last Adam, stripped Satan, took the world back, took us back as many would come to Jesus, and took his weaponry away from him. Satan cannot show up in your living room and go, blah, 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 blah. he hasn't got the power to do it. Now, if you start practicing the occult, you'll bring him right in. He comes when you call him. Also, too, I want to tell you about that ding-dong. I want to tell you a little bit. You start being curious about the paranormal and stuff like that. Now, I have to study all of that. And you don't do it properly. He'll take your curiosity and he'll lead you on a carrot trip. I can actually tell you that in my studies, I have to bind and rebuke, but I can actually tell you that in my backyard, I've seen things move that nothing was there and stuff. And you say, how does that really happen? Well, it's because our curiosity. So let me just make sure those things are there, but don't put your, your faith in them. Don't believe in them. Just say, oh, yeah, I just rebuke that. Because it came with a fallen planet. If you knew that electricity could kill you, that comes with electricity. Let me say that again. You're not getting this. The fallen planet, you and I were born here. We couldn't stop that. Now we were born into somebody's fallen area, and we have to deal with life. Now, we're not, Satan goes, oh, I can show you how to deal with life. Let me show you some religion. How about those of you in India? Let's make some temples to me, your God. See these, anyway, Satan is playing havoc. He has a system running in here, okay? But you and I have a different system. We're under the kingdom of God. Can you say amen? But our attention is important because if we give our attention too much, the enemy will pick up on your curiosity. Do you remember that? I don't know who came up with this. Maybe, Peggy, you can help me. Curiosity killed the? That's actually not in scripture at all, but is scriptural. Your curiosity in the wrong things will kill you. Your curiosity and relationship with God will bless your life. There's only two kingdoms operating. There's not a third kingdom. Two kingdoms, kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And you know what? The kingdom of darkness is aggressive and forceful. But is kept back if our heart is towards God. So every human being goes under temptation and trial because the enemy is here in the planet. But he's not everywhere present. Let me explain how he works. Say, would you please, Pastor Kerry? Yes. He has a machine that came from God that he stole. And the machine is quite like the computer you have, like a laptop or a desktop. It has a lot of information in it. Well, he took it from God, and then he reversed all of the things in it. And the reason why he seems like he's everywhere, somewhere, never where, is he's running a program on you. I didn't know that. Yeah, he's running a temptational program on you. And the way to avoid that is presenting yourself to God, shielding yourself from it. Otherwise, he'll run scenarios on us. We call them temptations. How many here have a cell phone? How many know what an algorithm is? Algorithm is? They, they see what your interests are, and then they start running things your way. Well, that's what the devil does. He sees where your interests might be, and he shoves a program your way because he's not everywhere present. Only God is. 
And God is a gentleman. So I told you that Satan's kingdom is aggressive and tries to get us to lure away from God. God is passive aggressive. Listen, let me explain. God is very patient and loving, kind. And he will go a long time before the end comes. Has he been pa patient with us? Yeah. But see, when, when the devil, how many have children? If somebody picked on your children, wouldn't you have come a little unglued? See, you're passive aggressive. You love, you nurture your kids, but somebody tries to get to them. Now you're aggressive. That's how God operates. Well, I don't necessarily agree. Oh, go out there and try it for yourself. <laughs> I'm trying to give you 45 years of experience. Don't be such a dummy. Oh, I got to learn it for myself. Listen, some people never make it. You might know some. You lost a friend, a loved one, somebody dear to you. They didn't make it. Now, if they're saved, they got to heaven, they made it. But if they're not, all right. Oh, please, Pastor Gary. You see, the church is only used to 20-minute sermons. I preach at least an hour. And the reason being is 20 minutes is going to make you a champion. I only give you the information. Now you've got to go to God with it and let God reveal it to you. Say amen. And then, okay, so... He that listens to me shall dwell safely and be quiet from any fear of evil. Why? Because you're in God. Stay there. You're in the tank. He only has a squirt gun and a big blowhorn. And he's a blowhard. All right, next point. Wisdom from above. Where is it? Where's the wisdom from above? Say, in me. Yeah, in me. But it's above. Yeah. The Bible says if you be Christ, then you're seated with him in heavenly places. All right, let's go on. Read with me Colossians chapter 4, 5 and 6. Here's what it says. Wisdom from above. Walk in wisdom to those that are outside, not saved. Redeeming or buying back the time you lost. Let your speech, all, your speech always be with grace be graceful. Season with salt. It's either in or out. Okay. That you may know how you ought to answer each one. You know, one of the things is Pastor Kerry is here. I might be pretty intimidating, but I love for you to ask a question. Who is God? How does he work? What is walking by the Spirit? I never hear that from anybody. Do you know it all? You know, we're living in a day age, probably the last three years, where it seems like nobody wants to learn and nobody wants to work. Who do you think is behind that? Walk in wisdom to those that are outside. Our job is to win souls and touch lives. Can you say amen? And point one, church, the born-again believer has God living and all of his wisdom in their human spirit. And with God come all of his wisdom. Now, you might not be full of wisdom, but are you full of wisdom? You might not be tapping wisdom, but do you have the right to tap wisdom? We might not be operating in wisdom. So let me stop here and let me explain. Everyone say knowledge, wisdom, understanding. Okay, it's kind of like hope, faith, and charity. Knowledge is receiving facts and figures, hearing the word. Wisdom is doing the word, practicing it. Now, I know that if you're learning something, you will put it to practice and you'll be wise. Receive my words and gain my wisdom, you see. So if you don't like the results of how your life is now, you want it better? He who listens to me. So, let's find out. You got the wise one dwelling on the inside of you? Amen? 
And so the difference between knowledge and wisdom, knowledge is input, wisdom is output. Knowledge is hearing and wisdom is doing. Through the process of hearing and doing and acting, we gain how the understanding of how it works. You see, I know, I know that I know that I know that I know. I understand, I've seen it work so many times. So, you see how that works? Okay, knowledge, input, wisdom is doing. Well, if I do stuff and I'm still clumsy, just keep doing it, you'll get better. You didn't start walking perfect. Now look at you. You've been wearing different shoes. <laughs> Laugh with me. All right. Three, we as a believer must tap the source of God in us. Stop pulling information only from the outside. Pull it from the inside and learn to sit with God. Walking and living before God. Did you know Ephesians 1 verse 5 says that God had purposed in the beginning for you and I to be always before him in love. That would be like a father seeing his child play before him and be involved throwing the ball. That's who you are. Now, the problem is Satan still gets his thinking that God's out here and he's not in here. So we can't play and laugh as much as we really should. Have you ever guttural laughed where you felt like it was a care in the world and you just couldn't stop? Wasn't that a wonderful thing? Or to have peace come over you that just is awe? All of that's in you. All you need to do is learn to yield and tap its source. That's why we walk with Jesus. I'm going to walk. I'm going to walk with Jesus. I'm going to walk. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will. I'm going to walk. I'm going to walk. You see, a person that's walking with the Lord is not looking all around. Is looking through Jesus to the love and the care for others. In doing that, you're sowing the most marvelous thing. You're pleasing God in sowing, so God will add to you and enrich you, because he's the one that does that. Don't go out and try to make money. You'll lose it just as quick. Hello? Somebody said, well, Pastor Kerry, you, you seem like money doesn't control you. You bet. I've been a millionaire, and I wasn't a millionaire. Just like that. Now, not because I had the money in my pocket, because it, we were all worth that much. All the equipment and everything, the church, the churches, you see. But that doesn't matter. That's just worldly worth. You are worth so much. Who do you carry around you? You carry Jesus. Hey, let me introduce myself to you. My name's Carrie. And what I have to give you, oh, is the cure from a death sentence. Would you like to have what I have that will cure you from a death sentence? Oh, yeah. Pray after me. Jesus, come into my heart. So let's drop down to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Listen to this. Now, remember how wise and how strong and how infinitely we need to turn our life over to Jesus. Yes. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 30. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Do you know what a scribe is? Secretary. Secretary. Where is the disputer of this age? That's Satan. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since the wisdom of God, the world through their own wisdom did not know God. Romans chapter 1. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. You see, you got to have to reach out to God and God will meet you. If you don't reach out to God and Satan has allowed you not to, then you'll be lost until somebody shares the gospel with you. Now listen to what he says further. This is a key. For the Jews, nothing wrong with them. Remember, they're wonderful people. The Jews request a sign. God, show us a sign and we'll believe in you. That's what they said. And that's why God was displeased. And the Greeks, they want wisdom. The more I know, the more godly I'll be. Have you ever met a know-it-all? Have you ever talked with a know-it-all? <laughs> Come on. 
Knowledge isn't anything. In fact, knowledge puffs up pride when love lets all that air out. And it goes on further. So the Jews request a sign. Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews. It can be a stumbling block because they rejected Jesus. And to the Greeks, foolishness. This sounds like foolishness. It's born again stop. But so those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. It's actually saying, focus on Jesus, whether you're Jewish, whether you're like me, Scottish. <laughs> you know, come on. If some people are Heinz 57-ish, you know, focus is on Jesus. There's no physical. God's not looking at it. He even says that even though there's male and female, he's even said, I don't consider that. I consider your love for me as my own child. You see, now remember what the devil, this is worth a million dollars. The devil works this way. He gets us to be divided against each other. I don't agree with your football team. And then we get into a little argument about it. Wife with husband, husband with I, you know, nation against nation, kingdom against The idea is not to have any unity or peace because when we have unity and we work together for God, we can do things that no other people can do. That's why he always keeps us all divided up. Look at this election. Listen, vote your conscience. Follow what the Spirit is telling you to vote. Don't get caught up in what's on the air in the politics. Believe me, that's mostly lies. And don't pick sides. Remember, it's being divided up. You pick God. God, I want America to serve you, love you, and follow after you. So you pick the right person. Bring him in there. And you vote what God tells you to vote. Can you say amen? Of course, a lot of people want to help influence that. And I can't do that, really, because I don't want to be harassed. But at the same time, you know who to vote for. See, man, I just had something flash. Maybe it's a low battery. Okay, so you get it? Everyone say, I got this. All right, so he says, where is the wise? For, the, for the, since the wisdom of this world, the God through wisdom knows not God. And then he goes on, there's neither Jew nor Greek. It's all a stomach block, but it's interesting. It's interesting because God wants us all to know his son and to know him. Say amen. All right. Finally, our last point. My goodness, he talks a lot. Today I did, and I'm sorry. But one last point. Two kinds of wisdom. Everyone say two kinds. Say earthly and say heavenly. I want the heavenly. And you've got the heavenly. His name is Jesus, and he's in your heart. And we have the Holy Spirit who will walk us into the word, walk us through the truth, and he is in our heart, and he's all around us. And the Father who's above all, in all, and through all, he's in our heart. All of them, one God's working together. Now pay attention. Let's get his wisdom. I got the hiccups. If any of you who lacks wisdom, how many's ever lacked wisdom? What are we to do, Pastor Curry? Let him ask of God who gives to all, liberally and without reproach. You want wisdom? God will give you the wisdom, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, not doubting. Doubt comes from your flesh, comes from your soul that's unrenewed. Doubt does not come from your human spirit because God's in there, and God cannot doubt himself. So you walk in God. And any doubts you have, don't speak them. Hello, are you still with me? For anyone who doubts like the wave of the sea driven by the wind and tossed, let that person not think he will receive anything from the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Here James is warning us not to vacillate from our flesh to our spirit, our flesh to our spirit, but rather meet with God, get these things stable so that you'll grow and begin to develop the way God said and promised in his spirit, say amen, someone. Double-mindedness is vacillating between your 
old man and your new man, your flesh and your spirit. You're supposed to bring your flesh to God, a living sacrifice, and have it crucified on a daily basis. Then finally, James 3, and that's the last scripture, 13 through 17. Who is wise, say me, and has understanding among you? Let him show by a good mannerism the way that they behave, that his works are done with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast against the truth. Don't say you're saved and act like the devil. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where there's envy, self-seeking exists, confusion dwells. Every evil thing is there. But the wisdom that is from above, say it dwells in me, is first pure. Your motives are pure. Peaceable, you're seeking peace. Gentle, not rough and gross. Willing to yield if somebody wants to correct you. Full of mercy, forgiving. And, and good fruits without partiality, without hypocrisy. Say, I got the wisdom of God in me. Now, I'm just going to simply say, which one is in control of your life? God. Say, everyone say God in faith. So you let him control your life, and you'll find yourself making very much wiser decisions. If you got something out of that, would you give the Lord a praise? Thank you for letting me keep you.